So really excited to have Noah Levin today joining us. Noah is the design director at Figma. Previously, he was uh, you know, at companies like ClassPass, Google, Framer, and NASA. Really, really stoked to have you here, Noah. Thank you for joining us. Really excited for your talk. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah, it's good to be here. Thanks a lot, Preet. And I'm excited to chat with all of you all and show you a little bit of behind the scenes on, on what we do and how we work at Figma. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and let me know if this works. Here we go. Um, so Preet already introduced me really well. And just for some context, I've worked at a bunch of companies over the last 10 years and been super excited to be a part of Figma the last two and a half years. I joined Figma, we were about 30 people and now we're about 180 people. Uh, so it's kind of wild to see the product evolve, the company evolve, and it's been quite a ride. And I feel really lucky to be a part of it. Um, before we jump in, um, one of the questions we were asked as speakers is what are we doing during this time to kind of stay sane or like what does our routine look like? So just like a couple of little things, uh, you know, spending some time with family where I can over FaceTime. Um, you know, I, this morning, this clip with my grandma was from this morning where uh, I was able to finally get her on FaceTime for the first time, which is really exciting for me. Um, and, and, you know, holding tightly to family during a time like this is really a really nice thing to do. Um, I've been lucky enough, I live in San Francisco to have um, beautiful parks nearby. So I've been trying to like get outside as much as possible, um, playing some music. Uh, internally at Figma, we're like working on this like side project musical thing, which is kind of funny. Um, and then of course, like everyone else, probably a lot of Netflix. Uh, and also I just discovered Minecraft, which has been quite addictive. Um, so some context on, on my role and our team. And so you can kind of understand the process that I'm gonna go over here. Um, my role as director of design at Figma um, focuses on the product, but focuses on all kinds of things to create a healthy environment for product designers. And so we are a team of 10 product designers. And a lot of my time is focused on making sure that they feel um, like they have a safe environment, um, giving them good feedback as much as I can and creating things like the process I'm about to show you to make sure that you know, we have a healthy environment for design generally. I also spend some time with our community as much as I can and with customers directly. Um, I feel really lucky to get to meet with so many different kinds of companies working in design. Um, and then of course, uh, continuing to grow the team. So this is uh, what our team looks like these days, of course, spending time together on Zoom. And these are the projects that, uh, that people tend to focus on. We tend to split into specific areas, creation, collaboration, community, and monetization are our four areas. And each of these designers represent ownership of, of some subset within them. Um, and so it's been really fun to, you know, try to like figure out how to adapt together and make sure that we're able to like, you know, continue to be productive, but at the same time, recognize that we're not going to be as productive in a time like this. Um, we've, uh, <laughs> we had a Photoshop competition of like where, you know, where we might be uh, when things settle down, we're like, maybe we'll go to Mars. I don't know. We'll figure it out. Uh, so this is a, a team of what it might look like if we were together someday again. Um, but the process I'm going to show you, interestingly enough, isn't that different from what it used to be before for us. Um, we've definitely made some adjustments and some changes, which I'm going to go over. But generally, this is what our week looks like. And I'm going to go over what each of these specific times are. And just to be clear, this is going to be about our design teams process together. It's not going to be about how the product teams individually work. So of course, there are these pillars and trios of a design lead, a PM lead, and an eng lead, like most of you are probably familiar with. And this isn't really about how those teams work regularly to, uh, to move forward on their projects on like a vertical area. This is more about the horizontal design team and how we work together, how we collaborate to make the product better. So really quick, uh, you know, one thing that we noticed not having something like hallway conversations that we used to have in person, um, you know, we used to just be able to like have a conversation about anything or keep something light. And now it's like, you know, you don't want to, you don't want your time over these screens to always feel like it's always um, about the, a project specifically. Like we, it's important to get to know each other. We spend so much time at work. And so we kind of set up these optional meetings in the morning. Um, and you know, there, sometimes no one shows up. Sometimes a couple of people do. It's totally whatever people are comfortable with and can attend. Um, we just put on some jazz. It turns out Zoom allows you to like stream music, uh, which was kind of fun to figure out. Um, and so we made a little playlist together and just kind of goof off. This is Heather, uh, one of our designers showing her mug collection, just something to like kind of start the day on something kind of light and, and interesting. Um, the first thing we do um, together throughout the week is, is this is kind of a critical meeting that we call warm up in the beginning of the week. This is on Monday. Uh, it starts in the morning at 930. Um, and what we do is we spend this time in the way beginning, we might just recap our weekend just to kind of start with something light. Um, we start to go into some highlights of the week before. And in doing that, by the way, like we used to just go physically around the room and be like, all right, just go around. And now you can't do that with Zoom. Like you actually have different arrangements per person. So we actually just encourage each person to like pick the next person that goes after them. I'm sure a lot of you have figured out the same trick as a way to kind of facilitate a group conversation. Um, but that's something we've learned to do. 
Um, and what we do is we have a Notion doc that organizes the content for each of the warmups. Um, this is what that doc looks like. Um, and within it, we start again with those updates. We jump into highlights from the week before, just celebrating key moments and wins. And then probably the most critical utility part of the meeting is we actually schedule the critiques for the week. And we're gonna talk about critiques in a bit. Um, but this is a moment where we actually plan who's going to talk about what ahead of time, which makes it helpful for people to feel accountable for the things that they wanna share. This makes it a lot easier for them to plan what's going on, to invite guests if they want to. And it's also just gives everyone a bit of a sense of what people are focused on for the week. And so that Monday morning warm up is a really helpful time to plan for the week, to know what's coming and to schedule the times that we have together as a team. We also, of course, like update the calendar events so that they don't just say critique, but we actually include the, the topics of the critique so that you can kind of prepare or know if it's, they are kind of optional, although most of the time pretty much everyone goes, but you can choose, oh, that, you know, that topic isn't really relevant to me and I have something else I need to do and that's totally fine. And this lets people plan more easily. Um, we have a critique channel in Slack, of course, which we use for asynchronous critiques as well, but we also highlight the schedule ahead of time there um, whenever we can. Uh, on Mondays at the end of the day, we have a team meeting um, and this is at four o'clock and it's a time for us to talk about like team OKRs as a design team. What are the things as a team that we want to improve on, what, that we think we could be doing better. Um, and so, you know, this week, for example, we actually talked more about critiques in the time like this and how we can continue to iterate on them. Um, they don't always happen. Sometimes we cancel it. If there's no agenda, that's totally fine. Um, so I would say like maybe three of them a month kind of end up happening. We might spend a time sourcing if we're looking for new designers, um, going over what our expectations are and something like a career ladder, um, our design principles, anything that is outside of something you would take to a critique like a project. Um, and so this is an example from one from a few weeks ago where we were also just sort of thinking about how to adapt as a team during a time like this and really be intentional about how to adjust our processes. Um, at the end of the week, um, uh, I'm jumping past critiques because that's probably the, the bulk of a lot of what I wanna talk about. Um, but at the end of the week, we have something called cool down. So like if you have a warm up at the beginning of the week, cool down, it's at the end of the week. And this is a chance for us to honestly just like learn something new, um, maybe play a game together, share some kind of highlights on how, you know, maybe share how we're feeling, build something together. Um, this can look like all kinds of things, you know, a recent one we did and um, we sort of expanded this to include uh, our research team as well, um, was just sort of like having a chance to check in on how people are doing, but then also games. So like this is a game where you kind of you maybe you're drawing animals in five seconds and, and you know, it's just kind of funny and, and quirky and quick. Maybe something like telephone, if you've ever played like a Pictionary version of telephone where you have to figure out what the drawing was, you give it a name, the next person doesn't have the drawing, they have to draw something else based on that name and it becomes something interesting over time. Um, we've played a game where we tried to draw silhouettes of each other where like your pencil tool is down and then you don't release it until, uh, you know, until you're done. So like you kind of can't, it's like kind of more of a contour drawing. You can't really do a whole lot. I and mean, it kind of puts everyone on the same playing field, which is really fun. Most recently, we actually started making a board game together. Um, so we jumped in and actually it only took us like an hour and a half, which was pretty fun. Um, and we started kind of basically riffing off of Mario Party um, and using our custom cursors that we had done, if you had seen that over um, April Fool's Day and using those as like little board games. There's a plugin for Figma that you can roll a dice. And so we've been using that um, to try to simulate the, the feeling of going through something. So that was, just, I don't know, just kind of fun stuff. Um, as a part of these to plan for all of these meetings we're talking about, the warm up helps in the beginning of the week, but also we have this document we call the queue. And this document exists in Notion and anyone can add to it throughout the course of the week. And this allows us to stack up topics that come up throughout the week. So, oh, this one would fit as a team meeting. This one would fit as a cool down. This would fit as a, a critique, whatever it is. People sometimes go throughout the week and update this um, over time. So it's just helpful to me to lose track. Um, so critiques are probably the bulk of the, the time we spend. I've talked about some of the lighter moments, the fun moments culturally that we, we spend as a team. Critiques are like honestly a time for us to really um, improve each other as designers and improve the work more specifically. And so I wanted to spend like the bulk of this talk kind of going into how that works because it's something we've been iterating on quite a bit over the, over the years. Um, the, the driving philosophy behind this is that like we think critiques are one of those things that can be kind of intimidating for a lot of people. They can be uncomfortable, they can be scary. Um, but instead, ideally, if, if done well, they should actually feel like motivating. They should feel like something you want to go to, something that you find helpful and something that maybe like isn't so scary, but instead like, oh my God, I get this privilege to work with these incredible people and they get to improve the work that I'm doing. So I think ideally that's the feeling that you, that you have. Um, when we first started looking at how to improve these, we had a lot of issues. Like there were too many people in them. The feedback people were getting was a little shallow. Um, the problems in some cases were so complex that how are you supposed to actually get the depth of feedback you want? Cause you're spending half the time just explaining it. 
Um, a lot of you might be familiar with these kinds of challenges. And, and of course, we can't always solve all of them, but we do our best to try to improve each of these cases when they come up. So um, a lot of times what we do is we go into Figma to have like retrospectives or to have conversations about what we want to improve. And so we kind of sat down and kind of organized our thoughts around what wasn't going well, what we think we could be doing better. Um, we also wanted to make sure this was an ongoing conversation. So we created a Slack channel called Design Crit Crit, um, which is a moment for us to actually look at the process over time and not just this one point in time. And so if someone has an idea, they can just throw it in there whenever they want. Overall, we agreed on these goals. The, the, the goals for them should be that it helps to unblock you if you feel stuck. Um, that would be like a great outcome. If you're stuck on a problem and by the end of the critique, you feel like you're unstuck, that's great. Um, it should be to elevate quality. So this is something that should help from anything from visual design to interaction details or even overall product direction. Um, it should be for encouraging consistency. So we have this you know, luxury as a design team of seeing all the projects that happen. And so if we can catch moments that might be hard for an engineer or a PM to catch if they're focused on one project, we should be able to flag those to make sure people don't get inconsistent experiences. Um, and then of course, to share context, there might be a project someone's working on that affects someone else. And so we wanna make sure that people can catch those when they have them. It's very important to us that critiques remain a safe space for feedback. And to do that, we made the decision early on that they should not be a meeting where you're making decisions, where you're making really critical product decisions. That just one, you're, that means inherently you're gonna to have to have way too many stakeholders in that room potentially. It means that like all of a sudden the, the shape in, of the meeting becomes a lot less like a jam session and more like a formal presentation. And we really wanted to avoid that. We wanted these moments to be times together where you're jamming on something, where you really have the chance to actually jump in and improve the work you're doing and not be so stressed about, will this be approved, will that be approved? And at the end of the day, the decisions aren't left to like horizontally all the design team. It's, it's up to the individual designer and the PM and the tech lead. That's the trio that we trust to make the overall decisions. And this is a meeting where we elevate the quality of their work by giving them as much input as we can to make sure that that you know, can stay the case. And you know, there might be some small exceptions where maybe like we have to like overrule something, but honestly, it doesn't really happen very often. We really have a lot of trust that we hope that enables people to sort of be able to make the decisions they need to make armed with all the feedback that they can. With all that in mind, we created a framework of these six different feedback types that allow us to choose what kind of feedback we're looking for and pick a method that matches to that feedback. And so, you know, you easily can get in the habit of just having one type of critique and everyone keeps doing it. But it turns out there's a lot of different ways to get feedback. And depending on what you're working on, you can imagine presenting something slightly differently. We actually have a blog post that goes into a lot of detail about this. And I'm just going to kind of cover the high level of each of them so we can make sure to also save time for questions. So generally speaking, there's a standard kind of critique that you're probably used to. And this might be when you kind of need people to understand some context. So you have to give it some forethought in the beginning of how to share that context. Um, you, you, after you explain it, we always say, hey, does anyone have clarifying questions? Before just jumping into feedback, which can get kind of messy pretty quickly, we wanna make sure that if someone is confused, it's likely someone else is confused. So we take an intentional period of time to like clarify those, any questions people have that is not about giving feedback yet. Once everyone agrees that we understand it, then we start giving feedback. And in doing that, we can either do it by going around the room uh, and that's actually helpful so that if people don't feel comfortable speaking up, they have a chance to be heard. So you can actually go around the room. Um, but in some cases, if we don't have time for that, we might say, okay, we're gonna do popcorn. And popcorn sort of means it's gonna kind of come up at different times. Each person can bring up whatever they need, whenever they want. We try to avoid that method because it does tend to lean on people who feel most comfortable speaking loudly. Um, but at the same time, for short periods of time, sometimes you have to do it. Jams are our favorite. This is something that hopefully you've even had the chance to do today. I know we had a Figma workshop earlier for people. Um, this is something where you can jump in together and actually work on a problem. And it turns out you'd think, okay, maybe you can only do this in pairs, but actually like you'd be surprised at how much design work can be done as a team um, when you have the chance to jump into a file together. And so jams and workshops are another method. And someone can say, even at the beginning of a project, all right, like fresh slate, what do we want to try? Um, just to kind of get some early ideas in there. And so this is some examples of us doing that. Um, back when we were um, in person more, we still try to find ways of doing co-piloting is what we call this pair design, the chance for people to partner together. Um, in, in person, it might happen more organically because you're sitting near each other, but remotely we try to carve out more intentional times. So we try to assign for any given project a co-pilot to help them. They're not accountable for the project, but they're available to help. That way, if you have 10 people all sharing feedback at the same time, um, all sharing projects, you don't know which one to give feedback to, you could always be like, well, I'm the co-pilot for this one, so I'll prioritize giving feedback on this. Um, almost done here on silent critiques. We, uh, this is, this is what we use the most often, I would say these days, especially. Um, and this is, this is kind of surprising at first for people who haven't tried it. Um, the idea of kind of a, almost like a silent meeting. It's like, what's the point um, of, in a way, but actually what happens is 
the depth of feedback you get when you jump into a Figma file and you have everyone leave comments as sort of sticky notes, and we have templates for this that are on our community you can find, um, is that you end up can having multiple tracks of conversations at once rather than just like the loudest person in the room. And this becomes incredibly helpful for getting depth from a large group. Um, if you're only dealing with two people, honestly, you should just be talking in most cases, I think it would work fine. But in a larger group, this ends up being super, super helpful. Um, this is an example from this morning. I just grabbed a quick screenshot from something we were working on. Um, and so you can see that like we're on the Zoom, um, but like our heads are probably down, um, you know, and we're focused on mostly providing these threads of conversations happening through comments. And so that ends up being the most frequent form of feedback, but we want to be careful to not over lean on them in case it means that we're dodging important decisions or questions that are coming up. So we have to kind of keep it in balance and keep it in check and encourage us to step back toward the end of the meeting and say, all right, which of these topics really had a lot um, of meat to it that we really should be talking about. So we try to kind of mix and match a little bit when we can. We used to print out things sometimes, we can't do that anymore. We also have FYIs where you're just like, hey, heads up, I, need, I just need two minutes to share some context with people and that's all right. So again, the goal is match the method you have to the problem that you're focused on. And again, all of these should still be relevant whether or not we're in a remote environment or not. Um, we also, because as a company, we work to help people um, learn about design, we, the more people that are part of the design process, you know, that we think the healthier that can be over time. And so we feel this urge to encourage and teach design both externally and also internally. And a way to do that, one way we do that is we have this guide for visitors and we invite visitors into our critiques. When we were in physical rooms, this was actually a harder because the room felt crowded, but with Zoom, to be honest with you, it hasn't felt bad. In fact, when I'm giving this talk, I have no idea how many of you there are right now. Um, and so it's like, it's a little bit in some ways that you don't notice the pressure of size. And so that means that we can actually invite guests where they're silent the whole time, but all of a sudden they learn so much about how designers work, about the conversations they have. This has been super, super helpful for us. And every single employee at Figma has to come to a critique when they join at some point in time so that they can gain this, some of this knowledge. Um, we try to reinforce the good ones. So these are critiques that we think have gone particularly well and we keep a list of them. That way people can reference them over time. Um, we try to keep notes and we rotate note takers to avoid things like gender bias where maybe unfortunately some people get asked to do it more than others. We actually rotate intentionally. Um, we try to keep time. Um, when we were in physical rooms, we tried to use smaller ones so it didn't feel as scary like a boardroom. And we also try to make sure that feedback is done in a way that is fair. And so there's more on this that we're gonna write about at some point as well. So again, this is our week. This is what it looks like. Um, I spent most of the time talking about critiques because that's really the bulk of where work happens together. And I think it's particularly important to highlight. There's still some challenges. There's still some stuff we're working on. Um, you know, Sometimes there are too many people and it's hard to get feedback. Sometimes there's too many topics that we can't fit it all in a week. This is literally from yesterday um, where we spent some time trying to debug like how to improve them over time. So again, we're always iterating and we're always improving. Um, so thanks so much for tuning in. Um, I'd love to spend however much time we have left to answer any questions you have at all. Um, and I'm actually writing a blog post about all this that should go out by the end of next week. And so if this was too fast or too much, Hopefully you'll just be able to catch it online next week as well when we post the article with all this in it. Amazing. Uh, thank you so much, Noah. That was that was really amazing. I'm, I'm sure, you know, usually how you're watching YouTube videos or talks you watch at 2x speed, I think it's going to be the opposite in your case. People are going to be watching <laughs> it uh, in a half this week because there was so much amazing content shared. Um, I, I'm, like, there are a few other questions. Um, some that you had covered in your talk. Is it okay for folks to still share questions in the Slack channel? Yeah, I'll be in the Slack channel. Um, I've got meetings starting in about 10 or 15 minutes, so I, I'm, I'm not gonna be there instantly, yes. but I, I can take a look after. So definitely like leave notes in there and I'm, I'm in the Slack, so I'll catch you in there. Amazing, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. This was an amazing yeah. talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Great, awesome. Have a good one. Thanks Bye. a lot.